Great. And your sensitivity analysis. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and okay. Um, I'd like to uh, briefly, since I, I characterized aspects of model sensitivity analysis, I'm not going to already, I'm not going to spend as much time on the uh, particulars um, uh, of the conceptual foundation for that. Um, but uh, I want to um, just note that there's, uh, while we don't have time to go in, into a detail here, I'm happy to, exp uh, to expound on it further if there's questions. Um, sensitivity analysis is a rich topic in and of itself. I characterized some, some elements of it this morning, um, earlier. Uh, but suffice it to say that um, uh, you can also um, uh, understand it from many other dimensions. Um, one of them is uh, the degree to which you're conducting analysis of one parameter at a time or multiple parameters simultaneously. There's also a distinction between um, uh, situations where you're systematically varying a parameter in some deterministic way versus where you perform what's called a Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis. And here you're, you're picking values randomly from within a certain distribution for one or more parameters and seeing what distribution of outputs is induced or distribution of, of, of uh, comparability of, of intervention A versus intervention B. Um, uh, another use of sensitive analysis we'll be seeing is, is um, where we conduct it on parameters given, given the model. Another is where we just use model stochastics as our source of uncertainty or variability. And we, we do sensitivity with respect to model outcomes in light of those stochastics, recognizing that a given run of the model may yield somewhat different results um, uh, under different circumstances. Finally, um, uh, I'll note that there's a important tradition, which is under, uh, it's not as common as it should be in dynamic model, but you'll find people engaging in it, um, sometimes without naming it explicitly, which is called structural sensitivity analysis. And the idea here is, uh, while we conduct sensitive analysis with respect to parameter values, some of the most important assumptions about the model are in fact captured in the theory that is in turn expressed in large part by the structure of the system, the stages, for example, of, of a per that a person goes through with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, or the, um, uh, the, the, the stages that a person goes through with respect to opioid addiction or with respect to, um, uh, to commitment to behavior change, or what have you. And um, some sensitive analysis focus on the structure. So they might, for example, say, um, suppose we, we posit there's no asymptomatic individuals in the population um, uh, for gonorrhea. How would that affect the, pr the incidence and prevalence of gonorrhea um, uh, going forward uh, compared to if we did have uh, asymptomatic individuals. And you can get a sense of just how big a role that's playing in the dynamics you're seeing by sort of turning on and off um, certain uh, elements of state charts um, by this, you know, setting a, a transitions um, hazard to zero or by uh, doing something called ignoring it. So I want to show this in any logic just because it's, it's worth knowing about. Um, so if we were to um, um, go and consider that model from yesterday, for example, where we had, um, um, where we had the susceptible infected and recovered individuals. Um, one thing, uh, that you could do is to set, for example, associated with um, this, uh, this transition here, you could set this 
to essentially never fire. So you may remember, like if we ran this model here, what you will see is some induced dynamics over a network involving infection spread. Okay, this is a, uh, this looks like a, um, a distance-based network again. Um, and uh, here we, we, we see uh, uh, a dynamics induced. Uh, individuals are, are getting infection recovery. Actually, that doesn't look, from its dynamics, that doesn't look distance-based. I'm wondering if that's, yeah, it's a random network, okay. Um, I'll change it back to distance based because it will have a bit more structure to the results in terms of the spread um, and, and look less, less variable. Um, so, you know, this is one dynamics induced by this, um, by this uh, uh, state chart. But we could, for example, ask the question, what if we were to disable recovery? Um, the recovery process. One way to do this, it's very easy, um, just make sure you remember you've changed it in this way, is you know you could multiply this whole thing times zero, 0.0, 0 times this. In which case, essentially, people will never go across this. This is a hazard rate of zero, so realistically, it's never gonna, gonna fire. And you could run it. What do you think we'd see differently? Do you think we'd see any difference? Yeah, so basically everyone's going to get infected and they're going to stay infected. Um, you know, the infection goes up and instead of having those oscillations, it's just going to go to, you know, everyone, right? So this is an example of structural sensitivity analysis. We're actually altering the structure here by essentially saying, other than the initial people who start here, which we can change as well, um, you never go from infected to recover. You never recover, right? Um, another thing that you could do would be to, and, and I want to show you th this as an alternative method, you can, in any logic, when you have a element, you can say ignore, okay? And that will actually retain this physically there. You still see it, but it actually ignores it from the standpoint of it doesn't consider it computationally. So, so this transition will never fire. What do you think the impact of that will be? Yeah, people will get to recover. And do you think the infection will continue in the long term, oscillating around some, yeah. some equilibrium? What, what do you think will happen? No. Yeah, it'll, it'll spread. And then guess what? Now it's extinct. Oh, nope, there's one more. I'll hold out, I'll hold out, okay. Well, okay, there it goes. Okay, um, now it went down to zero, right? By the way, you can always export this to your spreadsheet if you're, you're choosing, if you so, so choose by, by, by doing this. Um, uh, okay, so uh, in short, structural sensitivity analysis is a real asset, particularly for illuminating understanding about a model, to, to, to build understanding about how does a particular, say, transition um, play a role in the dynamics that you see. And as you've just seen, it can be profound. And it, it may shape those dynamics in big ways. There are other ways we could do it as well. For example, as I said, you might have an infective symptomatic and effective asymptomatic and maybe asymptomatic individuals don't present for care where symptomatic ones do. Um, and you could examine uh, the impact of these assumptions or you could disable a death and birth for your model and run it with that. This will help even more so than parameter sensitivity analysis in helping you understand why the model uh, yields, yields results. Um, and it's my hope that e even if many people in the room never, never go on to, to build models of any logic, if you're working with a model that someone else has built, you should be able to do these sort of tests, right? Turn off a, a transition or ignore it and see the results. It's not without a little bit of, of, uh, of subtleties. I'll just note, for example, um, 
if we were to do something like, um, and this is not as good an example as some other models, um, but I could probably do it with this guy. If I were to ignore this guy, um, pro probably it's okay because this this can can survive without it. Um, but there are certain things if I ignore them, like if I had no transition here, don't do this at home, but if I had no transition here and I were to ignore this, um, uh, it, it might uh, be an unhappy camper. And in fact, I did build, and you'll notice, I don't know if you saw that, when I did build it, it flashed a red message here. And this is basically saying it's unhappy. It's actually saying more precisely than unhappy it doesn't know what I mean by this model. And why is it that it doesn't know what I mean? Because it's basically confused by the fact you can never get to this state. Now, you can't get there. The reason it wasn't a problem before was that I had this other transition here, so I could still get there and it would be a happy camper like this. Oh, well, I'll be. Um, well, that's interesting. I wish Wade were here to see that. Um, okay, um, this is interesting. Um, uh, I would have expected with this transition it would it would be very happy, but but um, but even now it it's unhappy about it. Um, and uh, you notice it it says hanging. Oh, I disconnected it. I clicked on that and I disconnected. No wonder. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you noticed that. Let's let's try that again. See this? See that? What's wrong with this picture? Can anyone anyone tell me? I'm gonna zoom in. What's wrong with this picture? That dot is white, and you may say, "Well, what's the big deal?" It means it's not connected. Is what it means. Um, and so if I if I tell it, it's gonna say one error here hanging transition. And it's going to tell me, if I click on this error, it's going to show me where it is. It says it's confused. And it's, it's not connected. So in order to connect it, I got to go and I, I, I make it green. And now we're, we're cooking with gas. Okay. So that's why. And now, now if I say ignore this, it'll still be a happy camper, I think. Yeah, it'll be happy because it can still get to the state this way. But if you can't get to a state at all, it's going to be one unhappy camper, okay? Um, okay. Um, so just be aware of uh, model sensitive analysis is valuable, and it's particularly valuable when building up, um, building up understanding. Um, uh, right. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Question. Yeah. Good question. Very, very good question. Generally, structural sensitivity analysis is used when doing, um, when, uh, when doing um, work with exogenous, oh, sorry, endogenous variables. You're disabling parts of the causal pathways in the model, um, and uh, so you're modifying the endogenous features of the model. Um, uh, I guess what, when you're doing it with respect to exogenous assumptions in the model, you know, uh, uh, endogenous features, I would view it as as a little bit akin to sensitivity analysis or extreme value tests, where you like you might extreme you might impose a value of zero of birth weight, right? Um, you're, you're, it's actually not you're modifying the endogenous process in some structural way. You're you're, you're setting the birth rate to be zero as an exogenous assumption. I, th I think of that as kind of extreme value test. The fact is, I do think of it also as kind of a structural sensitivity test in the sense that you're disabling areas of effective model behavior by doing that. But I guess you could take qualms with it and say, well, it's not so much structural as an extreme value test involving the assumption. And I won't quibble with that. I'm not one to get caught up in you know the wording of, of how we describe it but the point is being able to disable either through 
exogenous assumptions or by disabling structure in the model, um, you know, this, this is useful in, in building, building up model assumptions. And you're right that you can do both. So um, you're, you're absolutely right, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, you know, often we will conduct sensitivity analysis um, with respect to different parameters and we might summarize it. A spider diagram is a way to sort of uh, represent this. We might, we might change a parameter by different amounts and see how much the, um, the, the outcome changes when we change this parameter or that one or that one or that one. Um, uh, so, so the fact that this goes way out here might be when we change a parameter related to procurement, it ends up having a big effect, whereas this one here, uh, change one related to risk, it is a, a modest effect. So this is just a way of summarizing kind of differential effects. We have other cases, and I could share you a few theses where, you know, for example, we've looked at the impact of uh, changes to parameters on model behavior over time. And you have graphs that show, if I change this parameter by 10%, it yields a big change in this outcome, whereas this other one changed 10%, you can't even see the difference, something like that. Um, okay, um, so I'd like you to open up for the purposes of this presentation. I'd like to show you a, a useful feature of AnyLogic for learning to which we have contributed models, and it, including a number of health models. Um, and uh, I'd like you to, to grab a particular model, okay? The model we're going to be looking for is called SIR agent-based calibration, okay? And to get there in any logic, you do help. Any logic help has, it, it's not something to, to look down your nose at. It's actually quite, got, it's got a lot of stuff there. The part of it, we're, it's got many features, including tutorials, etc. I would suggest doing example models here. Um, by the way, Wade, what is download Chromium pack? That'll allow you to export a one Oh, I see. I see. So it's kind of a export a model that can run independently of any logic that comes with Chromium, yes. is packaged up with Chromium. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, any logic has a wide variety of example models, um, uh, and we've been privileged to contribute. One of them on the right hand side here is called SAR agent based calibration. And I'd like you to click on that, and it will open it up. And Probably, um, probably to avoid um, getting confused, it would be worth right-click on this and saying close others, okay? And uh, if you've got anything else open, it will close it up, okay? Um, okay. Um, so here, we're going to look at a very simple model that's not privileged. It's a kind of SAR type model where people contact each other. And here actually people, it spreads in, in space, okay? Um, and we're not gonna get too caught up in this. If people are interested in learning more about the dynamics of this, it's quite fascinating as a stylized model. And um, I will come back to this if I have time after after this. Um, what we're going to, to look at here though is two features associated with this. One is calibration and one is for, for, parameter, for parameter variation and looking at impacts of stochastics. Okay? Um, and so first we're going to go to this Monte Carlo 2D histogram. Okay? Um, and the idea here is any logic provides built-in support for sensitivity analysis, okay? With respect to two types. Number one, actually, you could argue multiple types. Number one, with respect to varying parameters, either in a regular way or in a Monte Carlo sampling way, where you draw their values alternative values from distributions and you simulate the results. Okay. 
In addition to that, it will allow you to summarize model how model outcomes differ in the context of stochastics. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll go see this. So I'd like you to open that up, up that experiment, which is called Monte Carlo 2D histogram. Okay. Um, and if you double click on that, you should see something like what is whoa, like what is shown uh, here. Okay. And we're going to look at a particular property in the parameters area here, which is going to be allowing us to say for this, for this parameter variation experiment, you notice that name aside, it, it's, it's called a parameter variation experiment. And in any logic, when you add experiments, you can actually choose what sort of experiment should this be. Should it be a, thus far, uh, we've been using only simulations. These run, it's a one-shot deal. You, you run it, it runs the model with certain assumptions, a single random number seed, it just runs it, and, and you get some result. Fair enough, and that's how we do most of our experimentation. That's how we do most of our learning. By contrast, there's a set of other ones. Um, and the one I'm gonna show you for simplicity is parameter variation. If you get more advanced versions of any logic, I guess I happen to have running here, sensitivity analysis, calibration, custom become available. And our group has made use of all of those. Um, uh, <coughs> Wade could, could tell you about custom experiment. Um, and uh, and we, you know, we could talk about the trade-offs here. But really, parameter variation experiment is enough for you to do sensitivity analysis, okay? despite the name of the sensitivity analysis one. And, and sensitivity analysis does, has some extra nice little, uh, little tchotchkes that you can work with. Okay, um, um, so this is a parameter variation experiment. And what you can do in a parameter variation experiment is either run the model many, many times, here it's 200, without varying anything, or you can run it in ways that you systematically vary parameters or draw them from distributions, okay? Free form would be used to just run the model as it is or to draw them from Monte Carlo distributions. Varied in range w would most commonly be used to, to vary them over a certain range, okay? Um, so the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to run this with a particular set of parameters 200 times. But there's a very important thing we want to check here. Under randomness, you want to make sure you're using a random number seed. Okay. And the reason you want to check if you're using a random number seed is that you should be looking to see if it's going to be run each of these 200 times with different assumptions about the randomness involved. In general, these models uh, will have stochastics. Those stochastics will only yield different results if you run it with so-called different random seeds. So if we run this thing 200 times with different random seeds, we will get a range of variation. And unfortunately, in the particular version of any logic I have, it's it's poorly displayed. I think the versions, oh, as they say in rural China, guai guai long di dong. Um, I okay. Well, um. I thought I'd be showing you something embarrassingly impoverished. Um, but uh, wait, does that surprise you? Any logic 4.0? That's not a change. It just happens to look okay with this one and then the distribution is made. Okay. Like is if it, you look at the vertical yeah. part of that curve, it's yeah. very light. Yes. And yes. yeah, sometimes it's okay. hit or miss kind of. Oh, okay, so even it's not this color or anything. Um, okay, 
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what you'll see here, though, is kind of a ghostly image. And, and I want to rerun that just so you can, you can see a little bit in a finer grained way what's, what's going on here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually restart it, okay? Um, here we go. Here we go. Um, and uh, I will run the, and you'll notice as I'm running this, it's actually filling things in. Watch this. So, and you'll notice this bar going across. And you notice it kind of filling in things. What's going on here is actually running the model again and again. And this little indication down here is showing different computational units of this computer running different runs. And this progress bar is showing more and more runs being made. But this ghostly image is summarizing 200 runs with the model. And you'll notice that there's a certain degree of variability here. Amongst other things, you'll notice there's kind of a bar down here and a bar that goes up above. Can you see that? Um, so so there's, there's one down at the bottom and there's one up here at the top. What this is indicating, well, does anyone want to pause it what this is indicating? This is summarizing many, many runs. What do you think that indicates? Well, it turns out there's going to be some runs that at this time, let's say time 40, never get above basically zero. And then there's going to be some which are up here and the range looks like, I don't know, 1,800 up to 2,400 or something like that. Um, and there's some variability up there and there's some down here. Now, you have to be cautious because this is sort of a cross-sectional depiction. You're not actually plotting out here individual trajectories. But what you're showing instead is kind of uh, at any one time, say a time between 40 and 42, um, uh, what were, what was the, the set of values for, for different runs? It's like a distribution of values. So one way to think about it, which I'm rather pretty, of, which I'm rather fond of, is if you cut this this sort of 2D histogram at a certain point, say, say time 40, and we were to look at it from the side, you would see a distribution. Um, at that time, uh, quite a few of the runs had essentially zero, had, had virtually none. And then, then there was sort of, a, it's a bimodal distribution, quite a few had virtually none. And then there were almost no runs that had between like 200 and 1800, and then there's going to be a peak here, or you know, peak rising, or second mode rising here, and then going down, and then almost none of here. So there's a bimodal histogram here at that time. This is a 2D histogram. For each little bit of time, it's summarizing at that during that period of time across these 200 runs, how many fell within this range, or within this range, or that range, and it plots it out. And um, it may be useful for you to, to copy this and go and, and call up a, uh, uh, a spreadsheet and paste it in. And it will actually show you, okay, uh, here, uh, this is, uh, these are different, um, okay, this is interesting. Would have expected these to be different, uh, different times um, uh, as shown here. Um, I see 200, 400, uh, 600. But what you see uh, here is um, how many of the runs fell um, from uh, between. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. I'm I, I'm sorry. They actually flipped this thing from this other version of any logic, I guess. So, so this has got to be time here, uh, along the x above, along the y-axis now, and this is number of people infected. That's along this axis. So, at time zero, all of the different runs, uh, uh, yeah, at time zero, all the different runs fell within the range zero to 200. So in other words, this bin is zero to 200, this is 200 to 400, this is 400 to, to 600, number of people affected. All of, the, all of the different runs fell within this range. Um, 
At time 2.5, they also, all of the runs, despite variability, had this. By time five, actually it's between five and 7.5, you had um, most of the runs fell at between zero and 200, but there were a few runs that had large outbreaks already coming, uh, even between 200 and 400. We have about half a percent that fell in that range. And as time goes on, you can kind of see this go down. Here's the bimodal distributions, for example. You know, most, uh, so about 11.5% of the runs had between zero and 200, um, but, but then way out here, there were 4% that fell between 4,000 and 4,200, 8% between 4,200 and 4,400, 10.5% uh, between 4,400 and 4,600, et cetera. So, so this is a summary of variability. But you may ask, where did that variability come from? Because as I run this, I'm not assuming any change in these parameters. So where did this variability come from? Anyone? I mentioned it before. It came, ladies and gentlemen, from stochastics. And the fact that the vagaries of the model, who was the first person to get infected and what was their connectivity perhaps and to whom did they happen to transmit it? Um, maybe they only transmitted to one person initially, whereas in other runs they just transmitted to, to several people. Um, that leads to some variability in results. Sometimes maybe it dies out in a small number of runs. Okay. Um, this is with no variation in parameter. There's already some variability in results because this is a stochastic model. And by definition, that induces variability endogenous behavior. Does that make sense? In a stochastic model, this is not limited to any logic. I mean, look at NetLogo, you're going to see the same thing. There's going to be some variability in results, and it behooves you to examine that variability. Because maybe we make a run, a particular run, maybe with a fixed number seed. And all you see is uh, no outbreak. You can't assume that's representative of most runs or all runs. So you want to run it in general. You, at some point, you want to start running your model many times. And you want to summarize it. And this is one way of summarizing it. It's a popular way. It's a, it's a what's called a 2D histogram, okay? Um, so it's, it's characterizing the results as a distribution um, over time. This purely induced by model stochastics. Let's go into this a little bit more though. Um, so, so we see some variability. We see some runs where you have, you know, up to 7,000, 7,000 individuals, well, let's, let's take the peak here, right? Here's the peak. At time 15 was sort of the maximum. So there are some between 7,000 and 7,200, some runs with no difference in parameter values, no difference in model structure, just differences totally associated with the vagaries of rolling the dice. Some had between 7,000 and 7,200. But there were some, 11.5%, that are between zero and 200, where probably the infection never really took off. So just be aware, there, there can be large variations in these results, large variations, um, from stochastics alone. How big will those differences be? It'll, <coughs> excuse me, it'll depend, model to model. So you'll wanna look at it, okay? For your models, you wanna run them many times. Um, we could run this more times. I could run it 2,000 times. This is going to take longer. It's going to run this model again and again and again and again, 2,000 times. And it's going to take longer. But what you will see is, look at that, the first one seems to have been a dud. <coughs> the, excuse me, the infection did not take off. Um, it's running here. It's, it, this blue bar is indicating a slow progress. <laughs> Uh, and we see it um, progressing here. 
But suffice it to say, after 2,000 runs, it's not going to look all that different from what it did earlier. It's not going to look that different. Because there's enough regularity here, you're going to have basically two patterns. One is this tends to go up and come down, and there's some variability. But by and large, it's going to be an upsurge of infection that at its peak you know, is going to be somewhere between 4,000 and 7,200 in size. Um, but there's going to be some runs that have virtually no one infected at that point. Um, there's regularities here. It's not, it's all over the map. It's, it's actually clustered around these two possibilities. Okay. Um, let's go look at this a little bit more. Um, now suppose we were to vary parameters, okay? Um, uh, so if we were to vary in range here, how do I get to this? I get, this is under parameters here, ladies and gentlemen. So if I were to go again to parameters and I do varied in range, this allows me to vary them, okay? And, and maybe I'll vary them here in some systematic way. I'll, I'll have five possibilities for Average duration of infection, okay? Average, that's what this is, average illness duration. That, that reflects how long it is until they recover. The amount of time they spend here on average is average illness duration, so the hazard rate of leaving is one over average illness duration. It's just, just an exponentially distributed residence time. Okay, so let's go, go back to that uh, here, and let's set that. Okay, so I'm going to set this to varied in range between here 5 and 25 in step 5, okay? 5, 25, step 5. I would note that that's five possible values, okay? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Okay, now here there's a further question of well, I'll, I'll run this. It will run initially, unless I say otherwise. It's going to run at one time for each of those. Later, we'll come back to this replication thing. But it's going to run at five times. Before, I said 2,000 or 200 because I could tell it how to do it. Here, I'll do five. Okay? It's going to run it with five different values for this average illness duration. When it's five, when it's 10, when it's 15, when it's 20 and 25, between Min and max according to that step. Here we go. What do you think the results will be? Do you think it'll look just like that last one? You think it'll look the same as the last one we saw? Will it look just like, like, uh, oh, oh, I thought I had a nice picture of it. No, it'll look like that. <laughs> okay. I uh, played my hand too close. Um, here it is. Okay. Does this look like that last one? Mm -mm. Changing this parameter value induced quite a change in the trajectory of the illness. You know, if, if we had, if you saw the order, you might have predicted, but a shorter average illness duration, what do you think? Would a shorter average illness duration lead to more people getting, being sick at a given time or fewer? If you have a, let's put it this way, if you have a longer illness duration and you consider what fraction of, or what number of people are infected at any one time, the prevalent case count, will it be higher or lower? Higher. Hmm. And people stay sick for a long time. Imagine they were sick forever. Number of people who are sick at a given time will be higher. Okay, if if people recovered almost instantly, there'd be very few people. Okay, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we see this variation amongst these, and we could examine another parameter here. Um, and you, oh, by the way, I should have emphasized, and I, I stand stand corrected. How many, how many runs did that make? Anyone notice? 
if we ran it, it only ran it five times, okay? It, it ran only five of them. Okay, now let's try doing sensitivity analysis, what's called multi-way sensitivity analysis, with respect to our second parameter. Let's change infection probability in a range from zero to one with a range of 0.1. So we'll vary two parameters together, maybe find there might be some interaction effects, okay? Um, often we'll vary just like we do with step rise regression. Maybe we examine one in isolation. Maybe we change that one back to fixed. Don't worry, you'll remember the session, the settings if you change it back. I'll change the original one to fixed. I'll go to, I'll go to infection probability, go between zero and one with a step of 0 0.1. There we go. And let's try running it. Okay. And there we are. Mm. So very small values tended to lead to a very slow infection rise. As you get higher, it leads to faster infections um, and, and pronounced ones. Okay. So um, here we're having some um, uh, some significant variation in the speed of infection transmission. Now, we could always examine those together by changing this back to range. Now we could examine it together, okay? Um, so I would note there were 11 possible values for this latest one. The original one had five possible values, okay? So if we vary them together, how many runs do you think they'll be? Five times 11, 55 runs. It's examining all possible combinations. It's like a full factorial sort of situation. And um, it's going to do 55 runs. And this is worth doing sometimes because at least on a bivariate basis, um, sometimes you get interaction effects that are not obvious. Um, maybe it doesn't vary extremely much with one in isolation or the other in isolation, but you examine it together, it, it does. So it's, it's sometimes worth doing. So we can run it together and it will take care of that. And unfortunately, this is uh, faint, and I think this is what Wade was talking about. You notice how big the dark bar is here, though. And if, if we exported this, you know, I'm going to do export. I'm going to call up my spreadsheet of choice. Um, and we were to go look at this, what you'll find is kind of an interesting commentary for most of the runs, even around that peak time that we saw earlier, but for others, um, you know, at no point is there less than, is there fewer than, well, 0.4, so 40% of all runs that lie between zero and 200. So there's an awful lot of runs in that combination that, that never take off, okay? And the problem here is combinatorial uh, explosion. You know, you can only do this with so many, but bivariate is good practice uh, to do it with bivariate and look for, for possibilities. Um, it's possible to reduce the number of parameters you do this with through a variety of techniques that you have to do it with. Technique known as dimensional analysis, I won't go into. You can also judiciously sat, select combinations, and there's a thing called Latin hypercubes and orthogonal arrays, which can be used to kind of cleverly choose combinations of, of parameter values to really explore it thoroughly, not, not comprehensively, but explore it reasonably thoroughly, okay? Um, and um, I won't go into how this is done. You'll find videos of me teaching this material about how you implement this uh, online that I won't repeat here. Suffice it to say, this is a very important technique and a very useful and a very easily realized technique for uh, use with any logic models of any sort. System dynamics, agent-based, hybrids between them, discrete event, running this uh, in a sensitivity analysis fashion is good. Maybe I'll make one final comment here with respect to this. Let's suppose that we wanted to do Monte Carlo 
sensitivity analysis. In order to do that, I do free form. And then I might draw, for example, average illness duration. You don't have to do this, but I might do it from a log normal distribution um, with a, say, uh, a log mean of, of uh, one, a log standard deviation of two, and a minimum value of, of 0, 0.0. And really, I stand to be uh, criticized for not being more careful in this. So this is a draw from a log normal distribution. We've actually seen that before for incomes, for example. Okay. Um, hey, <coughs> hey, come on. No, okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll put it up here. Um, yeah. Uh, so here we're telling a log mean of one, a log standard deviation of two, and, and a minimum of zero. I'll show you a little trick in any logic if you're uncertain about what to use. Um, oh, it looks like it's not available in, in this particular moment, um, but I could go down and probably do it, uh, uh, do it uh, somewhere, oh man, um, somewhere where it, it needs a bit of uh, code. There's a thing called a distribution picker, which allows you to, um, to go uh, sort of examine what does this give and quickly get a preview of it. And uh, it's interesting, it's not enabled here, but in many other cases it is, and you can choose the probability distribution. In any case, I'll run this. Um, here, we are, we are running the model a specified number of times, okay? Um, and for each run, we're drawing the value of this parameter from this distribution, okay? Um, here we go. So instead of varying the parameter systematically in some range, I am drawing it from this distribution. You, you, you probably have trouble seeing them, but there's some ghostly images back here. This particular version of any logic is um, that I'm running. I don't know about yours on your machines yeah, here. Yeah, I love the same problem. Oh, well, when did it start? 8.3? It started with the chromium thing, so probably just 8.1 or 2. 8 .1 or 2. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, this is how you'd engage in Monte Carlo sensitive analysis. You'd set it free form and you'd put in place distribution draws from distributions here and you'd see how does the distribution the result um, vary. So if we, if we were to do that, I should have emphasized it here. I'll run that again. But if I were to do that and I were to run it full tilt, it's, it's running here 200 times. Um, when done, as before, I could go and export these results. Um, and I could look at, in a spreadsheet or a package of my choice or, or what have you, I could look at the distribution induced on this aspect of model output, the prevalent case count associated with this. And in my videos online, you'll find me talk about how you specify you know, how you capture the outputs from the model, okay? So, it's a little bit on, um, on model, um, model results uh, here with sensitive analysis, some of the mechanics of conducting sensitive analysis and any logic. I will, just a word to the wise, if you want to publish a paper on dynamic modeling um, in the health sphere, uh, you will be expected to do sensitive analysis. And it is very common, one of the most common things for a reviewer to say is where's your sensitivity analysis? You know, um, because uh, it indicates a certain robustness of the process um, if you are conducting sensitive analysis and a lack of potential curiosity and, and level of inquiry if you haven't conducted sensitive analysis. So just be aware it's a strong expectation that whatever modeling paradigm you use, sensitivity analysis is part of the bargain. I would say it is more, less prescriptive way as well. Sensitive analysis does help us learn about models. It helps us learn how, about the degree to which the behavior we observe is contingent upon stochastics, 
contention upon uh, parameter values and contention upon model structure. So it's a good, good practice to put in place, okay? Um, and I would uh, urge you to, uh, to put it into place, okay? Okay, um, just about exactly 12 o'clock. Um, um, I think what we'll do um, is uh, break for lunch. Um, I would like to use the large, large majority of the afternoon for project work, okay? And I'll go around to each project and try to seed ideas and so on. So why don't we, after lunch, break up into project teams. Um, I will go check if this list of TAs and contact information is complete. I'll fill in any remaining things, and I will myself go right to TAs that I don't see here in the room right now and ask them to make sure they're here at one, okay? So that when you come back, we're all ready to go uh, forcefully. Later this afternoon, we will have a lecture, I think at the end of, towards the end of the day on calibration and a little bit on GIS with models. Um, those will both be shorter. And then we're going to have a guest lecture um, uh, by Yuan Tian, who is the lead modeler and an esteemed um, uh, figure within the provincial health infrastructure on how she's been using these models um, in, um, uh, to inform policymaking with respect to ED weights and patient flow uh, as sponsored by our Ministry of Health. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, she did all that work in any logic uh, coming out of my group um, and she's now a doctoral student in my group. We're very lucky to, to have her be able to share with us this work that's had such an important shaping effect on provincial thinking about um, how to lower the, the, uh, the weights associated with emergency departments. So let's go to lunch now, and I will look forward to um, seeing you a bit later, and take some of those plums on your way out, okay? Because there'll be more coming tomorrow, okay? Thank you very much.